Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate Wickedly Smart Women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today I am welcoming a very special guest, Melanie Lentz. At age 22, Melanie became the youngest female secret service agent hired at the time. She was trained to be an expert at physical protection and did her job well while failing to protect herself inside and out. After her protectee, Nancy Reagan, passed away, she was going through a divorce, depression, and an eating disorder relapse. She made the tough choice to leave the Secret Service and start over in her 30s. The protection life lessons she took away from the Secret Service help her keep on track today. And I had the pleasure of meeting Melanie at the National Publicity Summit. And boy, as soon as I heard her story, I was like, damn, I need to have her on the show. (laughs) So thank you, Melanie. Welcome to Wickedly Smart Women. Hello, Angel. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Oh, my goodness. You are like one of the most unusual guests (laughs) I've ever had on the show. And as soon as I heard your story, I was like, This is definitely going to be an interesting show. So I want to start our time together today, Melanie, really with what inspired you to become a protector so young. Like what was part of that journey? Did you have a challenging childhood? Did you grow up in a a family of protectors? You know, where is the origin of you stepping into that role so young? Right. Well, I was not one of those little girls that grew up saying she wanted to be a Secret Service agent. In fact, I think anybody I grew up with would have, if you told them I was going to be an agent, they would have belly laughed hysterically because I am very naturally very shy. I mean, painfully shy as a child. So that life path was more, uh, was more for the people that were extroverts. So not, not me. But uh, I started college at 17. I've always been like the youngest one wherever I go. So I started college a little bit younger. And when you get out of college, there's that time of your life where you kind of need to figure out where you're going. And as many college kids are, I was pretty lost. I wasn't sure. I started as a music major, switched that to exercise science. I mean, you can guess we didn't know what we wanted to do. Uh, So I enrolled in grad school. I was pretty good at school, thought I was pretty smart and thought I'd figure it out while I was in grad school. But my grandpa, of all people, his best buddy's daughter, so this very roundabout way, his best buddy's daughter was a female Secret Service agent. And we grew up in the same little town in Southern California. And so, you know, nothing really big ever comes out of that little town. So she was kind of this uh, exciting person that had all these workplace adventures. And my grandpa said, Mel, you should do that. You, you were a college athlete. You're smart. You're young. You're, you know, you could handle it. I'm like, grandpa, like, I'm not shy around you, but outside of family gatherings, like this isn't a great, great look for me. But you know, when you're in college, you get a little desperate for, hey, I got to figure out something. So I met the very minimum requirements. You had to be 21 years old with a college degree or equivalent experience. That was the criteria to apply to be a secret service agent at the time. So I had a college degree and I was 21. So I thought, what the heck? What's the worst they can say? No. So I applied and went about my life. I did not think I was ever going to get a call back. And if I did, they'd say, little girl, get some life experience and try again in a little bit, you know, but they did it. They called me for a written test and I was an academic. So passed the written test. Barely. It was a tough test with somebody who did not have law enforcement, but I passed and then this, uh, they sent me to a initial interview where I thought they'd take one look at me. I looked 16. Somehow I passed that one too. And by then I thought, I've got to figure out what do I have to offer? Like, what do I have here? You know, I have to convince them to hire me because of my age, but what can I say? 
So my little, little brain had to turn around a bunch and I realized I know nothing. What's the point of training? I'm trainable. You're going to send me to eight months of a you know law enforcement academy. How am I expected to know it all going in? I'm willing to do the work. I already know that I'm I'm tough and that I can. I'm willing to do the extra legwork to get the job done. So that was my that was my pitch. Every time I went into an interview or you know polygraphs, panel interviews, home interviews, all that background stuff that you go through over a six month period, that was what I said. I am willing to do the work and I'm going to, I'm, I'm a people pleaser slash type a plus plus. You won't regret this. You know, I'm, and I'm like, am I going to regret this? But <laughs> so there was this fateful day in June, 2007, a supervisor from the Los Angeles field office. That was the closer, a uh, big office where I lived. He called and said, Melanie, we have a job for you in Los Angeles. Do you want it? And if so, pack your bags, you leave in three weeks and gulp with that phone call. My life changed a whole lot. <laughs> Wow, what a interesting path to get there. And what I love, and I want to invite our listeners to catch here, this is a really interesting distinction, is you got clear and communicated that you were willing and more importantly, that you were trainable. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize the value of communicating that when you are attempting to, you know, get a job or get, you know, engaged in some way where there is an already established structure. And so many times people go in untrainable and they have to be broken before right. they can be trained into the structure. So I love that you were wickedly smart there. <laughs> Melanie, and your your little your little brain is not so little. I love that. I actually also graduated at 17. So that's an interesting parallel nice. that we have. Yeah. yeah I, I left school at the end of three years instead of four. So it's nice. it's fascinating that we um and at 21 or 22, who the hell knows what they're doing with their exactly. life? Nobody, nobody knows no. what they're doing with their life. So <laughs> no. Let's affirm everyone in the audience for the wherever you're at on this journey. You had no clue when you were 22 about what you were doing with your life. And some of us, we get to a point in our life, just like you did, Melanie, yeah. where we do something and then we get to the point where it's like, oh, well, this is what I was doing. And now I need to make a change and go in a new direction. That's so right. can you talk a little bit about what inspired you or what happened? Like, did you have like an awakening? Did you have some catastrophe that happened? You know, what happened to help you to, to say, okay, been there, done that. It's time for something new. You're right. Well, like many, you know, very ambitious young ladies and gentlemen out there, I was a workaholic from day one. And you know what? I had a job that told me that protecting someone else was more important than whatever was going on in my life. And that's not a, a diss on the secret service. It just means it's just the reality of the job. You're following somebody else's life as you protect them. And so right out of training, this was early 2008, which as we remember is a presidential campaign year, an mm -hmm. exceptionally busy year for every secret service agent every four years, because the secret service also protects the major candidates. So I spent my first year out of training on the road a lot. I only took one vacation day where I requested a day off one the entire year. And it was my mom's birthday. And throughout that year, I developed some bad habits mm -hmm. and I own that now that's on me. I could have said no sometimes and I didn't. And I said yes to work and no to my family. And while I had some awesome, amazing adventures and stories that I mean, we could just talk the entertaining stories all day long. But what happened is you fast forward a bunch of years and I didn't check myself. I didn't protect myself inside and out. I neglected my personal life, my marriage. And my marriage was falling apart. Fast forward about eight years. And I found myself at a crossroads because it was my turn to go to DC. And that's every secret service agent's dream. You start in the field like I did in Los Angeles. You learn, you do protection assignments as needed. And then you go to those big details, president, vice president. That's what you want. The aviators, the earpiece, the movies, you want it all. And it was my turn and my marriage was in trouble. We weren't in a position to move. And there was a position or an opening on Nancy Reagan's detail, which you mentioned at the beginning. 
And she was in her nineties, a former first lady still got protection, but it was not the DC high speed look that I wanted, Mm -hmm. but it was the first decision I made in my career that was for my personal life. And I was very resentful and angry about it and not proud of how I reacted to having to make that essentially career suicide move to stay in LA, have more time at home and work on a marriage that would ultimately not last. Mm -hmm. So it was too little too late. And so my marriage is falling apart. I'm on a detail I don't want to be on because I want to be doing the big stuff. I'm a, you know, type A. I didn't want to sit around and drive a 90-year-old lady around. You know, no offense to her, but that wasn't what I envisioned at 22 doing this. And then Mrs. Reagan passed away shortly after. Mm -hmm. And her death was the catalyst to big changes in my life because by then, like many people, I'm not the only person in law enforcement that struggles with depression. I handled a divorce very poorly. Uh, was not taking care of myself and I had to ask for help. And that was a strong moment for me. And shortly after I asked for help is when Nancy Reagan died. And then I got transfer orders to DC, which is what I thought I wanted, right? That's Mm -hmm. what I had been hoping for. They were going to send me to DC. My marriage is over. Nothing is keeping me here in LA. I can do what I want to do. And sometimes you just have that sinking feeling. Mm -hmm. This isn't, I am not going to get better. And Nancy Reagan's funeral was that moment where I realized I don't like who this person became. I don't like who I became. Mm -hmm. What happened to that 22 year old? Because at Nancy Reagan's funeral, it sounds morbid to talk about, but they talked about her legacy. You know, what, what did she leave? And regardless of political opinions and all what have you, she left a legacy of fierce love. They always were talking about how fiercely she was protective of her husband. That kind of theme was the theme. And I thought my legacy is one of divorce, depression. I'm angry. I haven't seen my family at any major holiday in the last seven, eight years. I don't like who I am and I need to make some changes. And I woke up, this is this full circle thing. I am 10 days, I think it was 10 days away from reporting to Washington DC. I'm at the Republican National Convention, 2016. So my assignment was Republican convention, then we leapfrog to the Democratic convention, and then I'd report to DC. This was my final two weeks before I went to the detail. And we were housed at Kent State University. It was in Cleveland that year. The hotels were full, so I'm in a college dorm room. So this first full circle thing is I'm a college student applying to the Secret Service, and I wake up one morning in a dorm room in a college setting, 10 days from reporting to what I think should be my dream job. And I woke up and said, I have to quit. I can't go. I cannot go and become somebody I'm proud of. I have to have to leave. And it was so I was so sad, but it was so sure. You know, those moments where, you know, you have to make a big move and you're just, oh, this is going to be tough. So from a college dorm room and those scratchy little sheets and those, you know, build a bunk bed things, I'm calling and texting my bosses saying, I know this is a wrench in the plan, but I have to do this. What do you need from me? And with that, I hung up the phone and I felt that relief, that knowledge I've done the right thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that started. So I finished my assignment and I think, okay, my stressful marriage is gone. So that stressor or trigger is gone. A stressful job that is keeping me from growing as a woman, that's gone. Everything gets better, right? (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) Because I had a lot of internal work to do. And I like to tell this little story, if we have time before the break, about the day I turned in all of my gear as a Secret Service agent. I actually want to hold that until after the break. Yes, I want to hold that until after the break because we are already at the break. So you're clearly a Secret Service agent because you saw my eyes. Look at the clock and I bet you're paying attention to the body language and everything. So yes, we are going to take a short break. Right now, I want to just say to our Wickedly Smart Women audience, we need your help if you're enjoying the show and want us to stay on the air please consider making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com I also want to let you know I started a new club on Clubhouse now not everybody is on Clubhouse yet but uh, it is a brand new audio app social audio and I've had a lot of fun on Clubhouse and met a lot of amazing people and made the decision to start the Wickedly Smart Women 
Entrepreneurs and Change Agents Club on Clubhouse. So definitely reach out if you would like an invitation to Clubhouse, if you would like to have the link for the club. Uh, And we also want to just encourage everyone who's listening to the show to please share this show with all of your lady friends. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We're welcoming thousands of downloads from all over the world. We are now up to 81 countries. So let me get out my country list here, and we're going to send a shout out this week. I think we should shout out to the people in Washington, D.C., because why not? Let's also shout out to our listeners in Germany, in Taiwan, and in Singapore. We'll just go right around the world there. And we will be right back with Melanie Lentz. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition. Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your Wealthy Life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Melanie Lentz. Uh, Before we went to the break, she was getting ready to tell us another part of her action-packed story. But before I let her have the mic again, I want to let everyone know that she's written a book called Agent Innocent. And she also has a workbook, a companion workbook for the book that will help readers to distill some of their own life lessons out of the work that she has put into her book, Agent Innocent. You can find out more about Melanie at melanielentz.com. We will have her information in the show notes. And I'd love to just turn the mic back over to you, Melanie, because you were on a roll before we went to the break. (laughs) So tell us what's next in the story. All right. So I make the decision. I'm leaving the job full circle and from that college dorm room to college dorm room. Here I am quitting my job as the type A responsible person with no plan in place. I just quit my job. What am I doing? I thought I'd lost my freaking mind. So I go show up that next Monday to show up to work, to meet my boss with all of that baggage, figuratively and literally, that I had been carrying around. I have my ballistic vest, I have my gun, my badge, my credentials, it's all there. And I have to turn it all in. You know, my purse has been a lot heavier, you know, for the past many years. And you know what my ego said, oh, they're gonna talk me out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna come in here and they're gonna say, no, we don't wanna lose a good agent like you. Please consider staying. You know, my ego want kind of wanted them to do that. You know, admittedly, I wanted them to try to talk me out of it that I hadn't, you know, given so much of myself and they didn't notice, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I handed all my stuff in and all my bosses said was, good luck to you. You know, they were nice, of course, but there was no wish you'd reconsider, nothing like that. So they hand me a validated parking ticket because I had to turn in my building pass. You know, I don't have access anymore. I walked to the elevator landing with my pass and nothing else. And this guy comes out into the opposite end of the elevator landing and he's wearing his gun and his badge, looks really young and fresh faced. So I'm like, oh, he must be new. He's not, you know, weathered yet. And he looks at me and he says, hey, I'm so-and-so. Uh, you must be one of the new agents in the office. Nice to meet you. And I was like, with just like that, I'd been replaced. Mm-hmm. My workplace could find someone else to do my job just as well, if not better than I had. And suddenly, in that moment, it became very real that I was no longer Melanie Lentz Special Agent Secret Service. I was just Melanie Lentz. And I wasn't sure who she was anymore. Yeah. And so I thought everything would get better, but it didn't. I struggled. I I had that had been my identity. 
And, you know, I really had a hard time dealing with the depression. It's something I, I thrive despite of today, but something I had to be very aware of and, and deal with and ask for more help. And the stressors might, might be removed, but I had some inner demons to face. And I know that. And, you know, it's easy to cast blame and play the victim, which I did, especially when it came to the divorce. But at the end of the day, I can own my part and grow from it. And so as I kind of started rebuilding, I started writing. And that's kind of how the memoir came about. Agent Innocent was... Yeah. I thought, you know, that underlying personal story has a lot of parallels to protection. And that's how I've chosen to take those lessons and apply them to my life today, where like, for example, I loved protection. I mean, I got a thrill out of creating security plans for an event, you know, access points. Where are we going to post the agents? Where are we coming in, out? Where's the, where's the safe house, emergency, egress? You know, I, I lived for that stuff. I nerded out every time I got an assignment like that. But you know what? If I looked at myself as a protectee, I am worth protecting. The person I want to be is worth protecting. And when I looked at it that way and kind of created my own inner and outer security plan, I realized that I'm a better woman because I keep that security plan. And for example, as somebody who is depressed, I know many can relate to this, is that you want to kind of withdraw and revoke access to everyone. Mm -hmm. But the president himself can't revoke access to everyone. You know, as an agent, you want to put him in a bunker and hologram his butt on the stage so that nobody gets access, right? You can't do that. It's the nature of the job. You have to grant some access. Right. And so part of what's learning for me was where that positive access should be granted. You know, we can grant access, deny access, limit it or revoke it. And it's kind of part of me is I protect my legacy, who I want to be mm -hmm. by looking at access control. And, you know, maybe it's who and what kind of controls how I feel about myself every day or how I act or my, who affects my actions. And when I think about it, I am more likely to revoke access than allow positive access. And I realized that's kind of what I'd been doing for a long time. Yeah. I had some relationships to rebuild, especially with family who loved me despite my dysfunction and were always there. And so I have kind of chosen to view myself as a protectee and that access control and realizing what needs to be limited, the negative, what might need to be revoked. And that's the hard part because I realized I had a lot of friends that weren't really my friends. And yeah. when I wasn't an agent anymore, that really came out. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, there was, it's been a big learning curve. And, you know, I, I started writing that workbook because I talk about those life lessons at the end of the book. And I thought, you know, I wish I had that before I started started adulting. You know, I was so gung ho. I was going to be meaningful and do something, but I, I lacked some of the life experience and the knowledge where had I have kind of connected these protection dots earlier, that would be a great, great thing for me. Maybe with my priorities and work-life balance that we all struggle with. That's not unique to a secret service agent, but I wish I had those tools in place then. So I started writing that little workbook and I, I thought, oh, this is going to be for, you know, high school, college students before they go off into the world. And then guess what? When I wrote this book, I ended up changing my jobs around a little bit more. So it's applicable to everybody, but I've realized that my life is going to change and I'm going to be thrown some curveballs, but yeah. I can still protect myself. Same as a secret service agent. You know, there's a, a roadblock or there's a protest that's blocking something. We always adjust, you know, we're doing 16 point turns sometimes but I can still protect myself despite all of that. And so yeah. that's Beautiful. kind of my, my life motto is like protect yourself inside and out. You got this girl. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I want to, cause there's so much, I mean, we could talk for a very long time, Melanie, but there's a, a few pieces of that that I really want to underscore for our listeners. Number one, I want to talk about that decision point moment. And I just want to underscore for our listeners that happened to me as well. I woke up one day and I was like, I got to get the hell out of the real estate business. And, and it was it, you know, some people take a slow path to making a life change. And other people, it's literally like popcorn, like one second, you're a colonel. And the next second, you're like this poofed up and you're out. And you are out of whatever it is that you were in. So I just want to underscore that 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 can happen. It can happen sometimes that way where you just have that epiphany moment where you must go or you know that, you know, I mean, you must go. It's it's like a no choice choice, right? right. So I want to say I, I really want to underscore that. The second thing that I want to underscore is that at some point along the way, you became clear both about your own dysfunctional behaviors towards yourself, 
but also you made the decision and this is you know i keep hearing decision 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 you made the decision ultimately that you were worth protecting that you yourself were worth protecting and so i want our listeners to really hear as a kind of global communication to all of you, no matter where you're at in your life journey, no matter what circumstances you are in, you are worth protecting. And the third thing is that I heard that you made the decisions to start taking and applying everything that you had learned about protecting others to protecting yourself both inside and out. And I love that you bring that to the table because I think that, you know, a lot of times we're in this black and white zone of like, it's either all like the out here stuff that we're focusing on, or for some, especially those who end up in depressive states, it's all the internal stuff that we we stay kind of like focused on. So I love that you are, you know, bridging both of those worlds. We only have literally two minutes left. So <laughs> where'd the time go? <laughs> in the last two minutes, what would you like to impart to the wickedly smart women around the world, either about protection of themselves or, you know, just anything else that you want to say that you really want to activate in them? Right. I think one thing I have had to take away from my own story a lot and remind myself is that it really is never too late to start protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I had 10 years into my job, you know, and many people are like, oh, well, you might as well stick it out to the 20 and retire. But in reality, you know, they always say you only live once. But my thing was, it isn't too late to start protecting myself. And I may not have the logistics figured out. I don't know where my life is going to be in 10 years or where I'm going to go, but I do know what my legacy and what I want my legacy to be. And I know what kind of person I want to be despite it all. And part of kind of learning and growing and gaining that life experience for me was not to look at the past as a waste mm -hmm. or that I wasted my time or live with regret. And I made mistakes. That's the experience. That is the life experience. And so for me, it would be easy to look back and say, well, why did I bother, you know, staying there for so long? but look at what all I learned. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost where I recognize I know who I want to be. I can protect myself despite the curveballs, and I can look at the past and apply it every day so that I don't go back there. I think that was the healing point was where I didn't look back on the past with so much regret. I looked at it as I don't want to go back there. And now I have the tools to not go back there. Yeah. And so that's why I say it's not too late. And you know what? Like I said, I had to do it again. I had to make big life changes again, writing a workbook geared towards people that were 22. So it's a daily thing and you're going to fail. We all fail, yeah. but we're going to pick it up and it's not too late to make those changes. So yeah. that's what I, I tell myself every day. And that's what I hope your listeners take out away from it as well. Beautiful. Well, to bring it full circle too, I want to just emphasize that you came in trainable mm. and those entire 10 years were your training ground. Exactly. And now you've graduated from training into your real life. And so thank you, <laughs> Agent Innocent, for coming on the show. What a pleasure to have you. Listeners, we do love feedback. Please let us know what you thought of today's show by calling into our listener line. We'll have that for you in the show notes. Or you can send in questions or guest suggestions to listeners at wickedlysmartwomen.com. We might even give you a shout out on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are not only worthy of being protected, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.